The 911 attack on America looked so much like a formula action-packed Hollywood disaster movie that it had made in the USA written all over it. The only difference is it used real props and real people. It had terrorist villains, American firefighter heroes, fireball explosions, collapsing buildings, pedestrians chased by dust clouds, and it even had a God Bless America music score. Well-positioned cameras shot the action-packed drama from every conceivable angle. Just the picture of the helicopter landing and the president walking in. And then the president 19 walking. hijackers have been Saudi nationals. So in the terrible... He said that he didn't believe that Osama bin Laden... No one has blamed or accused him formally. But how many people worked in the city is confirming that some 265 firefighters are believed. None of us will ever forget this day. People will not be families down or hear all of us down. America remembers Sunday 83. The timing, the title, and the eerie advertisement for Harvey Weinstein's Lord of the Rings movie called The Two Towers was a prophetic and disturbing coincidence. Profits from the Two Towers movie were small change compared to the 911 reality disaster movie, which has become the world's top grossing production of all time. The only thing missing are the 911 producer, writer, and director credits. But it doesn't take an Enron accountant to figure out who's cashing in. During the first week, the 911 producers made a spectacular fortune just on the stock market alone. How? by knowing in advance that the stocks in airline and insurance companies associated with the 911 crash would fall in value. Using that inside information, they made negative bets on the stock market called put options. Put options are bets that a certain stock will fall in value by a certain date. It's big risk gambling, unless you've got inside information that can turn your bet into a sure thing. But that's illegal if you get caught at it. Put option bets on the decline in 911 related airline and insurance stocks skyrocketed by a whopping 600% just before 911, which means that somebody knew about the attacks before they happened. Who exactly were those somebodies? Merrill Lynch and HSBC, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, the Bank of America, weapons manufacturer Raytheon, the Lehman Brothers, General Motors, Swiss Ray, Munich Ray, and Axa Ray Insurance Company, which owns 25% of American Airlines. These insiders bought put options through Deutsche Bank. Most demanding clients trust Deutsche Bank to perform. A Deutsche Bank, a passion. Buzzy Klongard, the former executive director of the CIA, just happened to be the manager of Deutsche Bank. And so the profiteers from 911 were not Osama bin Laden or his band of U.S. trained Arabs. They were blue-chip Israeli, U.S., and British businessmen. Within the first week, the 911 producers sucked up $40 billion in box office profits from U.S. taxpayers who were hypnotized, terrorized, and traumatized by the infinite reruns. Think of it as a conspiracy theory, true or false test. A. When George W. Bush started his first oil company, who helped fund it? Osama bin Laden's brother and brother-in-law. True or false? B. After a terrorist bomb at a barracks in Saudi Arabia killed 19 Americans, who got the multi-million dollar contract to rebuild? The Bin Ladens. True or false? C. On the morning of September 11, 2001, who was in a meeting at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Washington? George Bush Sr. and Osama Bin Laden's brother. True or false? Actually, the answer could be D, all of the above. Because believe it or not, as far-fetched as they sound, each and every one of those things, the Bin Laden link to the Bush Oil Company, the Bin Laden construction contract after the terrorist bomb, and the Bin Laden-Bush meeting on 9-11 is true. Many of the facts surrounding the events of 9-1-1 point to a cover-up like the fact that the Bush administration ignored all of the advance warnings of the 911 attacks. Warnings from FBI agents like Colleen Rowley and from the famous Phoenix memo were not only ignored, they were suppressed. FBI Deputy Director John P. O'Neill quit his job when his investigation of Osama bin Laden was blocked. 
According to a September 24th Newsweek article, top Pentagon officials canceled their travel plans for 911 because of security concerns. While the American public were sitting ducks, all of America's political, military, and corporate VIPs were kept out of harm's way. Two Muslims accused of the 911 hijackings took their flight training at Rudy Decker's Huffman Aviation School in Florida. Rudy Decker's is linked to the CIA and drug smuggling through Carib Air and Britannia Aviation, which shared the same small Venice airport with Decker's. The media reported that on the night before the attacks, accused ringleader Mohammed Atta and two other Muslim hijackers got drunk, fondled naked dancers in a Florida strip club called Shuckums, forgot their business card and their Koran holy book at the bar, publicly bashed America, and loudly boasted about impending bloodshed the next day. Would devoted and highly secretive Muslim hijackers risk their planned mission by attracting so much negative attention? And why were they in Florida instead of Boston the night before their suicide flights? On the early morning of September 11th, 19 Muslim men well known to intelligence and security agencies supposedly waltzed past airport security checks, boarded four passenger planes, and turned them into deadly missiles without even a hitch. By 8.13 a.m., flight controllers temporarily lost radar contact with American Airlines Flight 11 and reported a suspected hijacking. Even though Andrews Air Force Base is only 10 minutes from Washington, emergency response fighter jets took close to an hour instead of the typical 15 minutes to scramble and begin searching for the hijacked planes. By then, it was too late. President Bush already knew about the first Flight 11, which occurred at 8.46 a.m., when he sat down to chat with school kids at Booker Elementary School. It wasn't until 9.05 a.m. that he was notified that a second plane, Flight 175, had also crashed into the World Trade Center and that America was under attack. Instead of being whisked to safety in this national emergency, Bush nodded and continued chatting with the kids for another 20 minutes about a pet goat, while American citizens were burning alive and leaping to their death from the smoking towers wailing against the wind as they fell, almost as if they had second thoughts. It was, it was absolutely horrifying. And you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to wonder exactly what President George W. Bush knew about the attack, and when he knew it. According to the official White House version, it was at this moment in a Florida classroom that Bush learned the second plane had hit the World Trade Center and that the U.S. was under attack. But here's what George Bush himself said almost three months later when asked about September 11th. I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower. of, an, of a t You know, the TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, I said it must have been a, a horrible accident. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. Now, wait a minute. George Bush was told about the second plane while he was inside the classroom. So you just heard him describe seeing the first plane crash on television that day. But that's impossible. No one saw the first plane crash on TV on September the 11th because the videotape of it didn't surface until the next day. At 9.55 a.m., President George W. Bush took off in Air Force One with no escort or protection from fighter jets and circled around for the next hour. Why was the president's plane airborne and unescorted for an entire hour while hijacked planes were roaming the skies? The inexperienced hijacker pilots who took only a simulated flying course reportedly flew the third hijacked plane, Flight 77, into a Top Gun 270-degree turn, bypassed the offices of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and crashed into an insignificant part of the Pentagon that was under renovation. Emergency response Air Force fighter jets were finally airborne when a fourth hijacked plane, Flight 93, crashed into a field in Pennsylvania at 10.06 a.m. The media reported that passengers overpowered the hijackers, but nearby residents saw U.S. fighter jets overhead and gave eyewitness reports of debris falling from the sky. 
That debris was found eight miles away, indicating that the plane had been shot down. Within hours of the 911 hijackings, a massive Blame the Muslims campaign was launched by CNN and the media and continues to this day. In less than 48 hours, the names and mugshots of 19 accused Muslims were flashed across TV screens. If government investigators knew nothing, how did they identify 19 Muslim men as the hijackers so fast? 